Uh, thank you. Uh, is this on? I don't hear myself. Can you hear me? Yes? In the back? Yep. Okay. Very good. So thank you, Professor Hoffman, and uh, thank you all for uh, um, uh, coming out at, uh, during your lunchtime. Um, uh, before I start, I just wanted to uh, some more space over here. You want to come here? That's, uh, I'm, I'm relatively safe. <laughs> relatively safe, <laughs> really. Um, um, I, I, come, 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 please. Um, uh, any good theater, the standing places are the best. Yes, it's true. Actually. Indeed, there are four yeah. or five seats here still. Yeah. I, um, uh, before I start, I, I, I just wanted to um, note for one moment that uh, today is September 11th, the 18th anniversary of um, the September 11 attacks on, on New York City. And um, the, um, as everybody here knows, uh, thousands of Americans died that day, and uh, hundreds of thousands of people died around the world in the sort of wars, in the wars all over the world that came afterwards. And uh, so I think it's a particularly important day to at least acknowledge and reflect. Um, for those who know my work, I've actually done a fair bit of epidemiology about the consequences of uh, the September 11 attacks, um, uh, both domestically and um, indirectly in other parts of the world. I'm not going to talk about that today, um, uh, but it's always a somber day, and I think it's an important day for us to, given what we do and given what we're interested in, to just pause for a second and reflect and say um, it is uh, an important day to mark and to remember that um, days like today affect the health and lives of, of millions of people. So thank you all for being here on that particular day. Um, um, on my, um, on my title, as uh, Professor Hoffman said, I, I sort of gave a longer title, which was on the posters, and I, I now have a bit more of a, of a precise title. Um, um, as those of you who do these things recognize, I was asked for a title a long time ago, so I've had time over the past six months to hone it down. And um, what I wanted to do is at least I wanted to start with um, just something a little bit for fun, um, recognizing that I'm speaking over lunch for most of you, so grateful to you all for coming over lunch, and also wanted to keep you awake, um, uh, because I figured that... Uh, at least half the audience is wondering what a well-tempered discipline means. And um, I, I'll explain that in a second, but um, the, what I'm going to try to do today is I'm going to try to bring together a number of strands of uh, writing that I've done, that others have done, that really are, I would consider them to be sort of at the jagged edge of arguments about epidemiology. And uh, there are there's a number of things that epidemiologists argue, that, uh, argue about, and uh, I have in my writing over the past sort of five, six years, try to tackle some of these as have others. And I've been thinking more and more about how to bring some of these together and how to bring them together in terms of understanding what I think are the core challenges epidemiology faces and solutions to those challenges. And recognizing that most people in a room like this, as I expected, would be students, it's really intended to be sort of forward-looking. It's intended to be a laying out of the issues as I see them, how one can bring them together, and a way of looking ahead for an epidemiology that matters. And in many respects, I mean, it, I mean this principally as a challenge to the students in the room who are going to be doing the great epidemiology of the future. So that's my intent. Now, what do I mean by the well-tempered discipline? So this is um, from Bach, Johann Sebastian Bach. This is the fourth few book one of the well-tempered well clavier. The well-tempered clavier was a uh, composition that Bach wrote in 1722 and it's two sets of preludes and fugues in all 24 major and minor keys. Now, why am I using this piece? This piece? First of all, I actually love this piece. I think it's actually beautiful. I really love Bach, almost as much as I love Chopin, but I love Bach as well. Um, um, the, um, what was remarkable about this is that it was really the first collection of fully worked keyboard pieces in all 24 keys, although the idea of having fully worked keyboard pieces had been around since about the, the advent of tonality in the 17th century. He was the first one to put it together. And he put together essentially a, a piece of music that was a well-tempered tuning system so that everything was in tune at the same time. This is actually the book This is uh, which is, that says the well-tempered clavier. Clavier meant, of course, keyboard, any form of keyboard at the time. And well-tempered means it was all in tune. It was all in tune, which was in contrast with the atonality that had gone before it. So the conceit of starting this way, apart from waking you up, telling you something that I thought most of you would not be thinking about, which generally perks people up, is to say, OK, so given that we've had pieces of epidemiology that have been out of tune, how do we together think about ways to bring these pieces together, bring them together in tune, to create a discipline that's harmonious in future? So that's the setup. That's actually why I called it that. The subtitle is, how do we make epidemiology matter in coming decades? Because I do think that in order for epidemiology to matter, we have to be cognizant of the challenges the discipline faces 
and potential approaches forward in those challenges. So with that setup, I now move on to the definition of epidemiology. Now, there's arguments about what the definition of epidemiology is. I actually don't really hold much, much truck with those arguments. I think this definition is sort of as good as any. This is the classic last definition of epidemiology, which is ultimately we're about studying the distribution and determinants of health states and or events in populations and applying the study to control the health of populations. It's understanding the distributions of health states, understanding what causes that, and using that to create the health of populations. And I have written, although I'm not going to talk about this today, that I see this as giving us the subject matter of population health science, which is the foundational discipline then of public health, where public health goes out and tries to figure out how to apply this to improve the health of populations. And that's the distinction that I've made between population health science and public health. So with that in mind, what is it that makes epidemiology distinct? What is it that makes epidemiology matter? What is it that is our unique contribution? And I think there are three things that we do as epidemiologists that we do well above and above everything else, above, above and beyond everything else, and better than other disciplines. And they are as follows. Number one, we document. We document human health. Number two is we understand what shapes population health. And number three, we apply rigor of causal thinking to that understanding. And I would argue that no other discipline really does these three anywhere near as clearly or as well as we do. I would also argue, that listing these three in this order, that we, as a discipline, are fussy about the hierarchy of what we think is important within this. And I'm here to say I think all these three are important. Because let's face it, very few of you here are planning on making a career in documenting, while many of you might be thinking of making a career in rigor of causal thinking. I'm here to say that I think all three matter, and I think all three are, are real contributions of epidemiology. So let me just give a couple of concrete examples of each of these. Let's start with documenting human health and why documenting human health matters the way it does. A, it matters enormously because we are, this is the best time in history to be alive. This is actually the best time in history to be alive because you are likely to live longer and live healthier than you ever have. Now, we do not often talk about that, do we? Like we actually, because we're in health and because we're dispositionally cranky, it's just how it is, right? you know, I can't tell you how many talks I give a year where I say things are bad. Yes, they are. I mean, I can, I can give that talk. I'm not gonna give that talk today. Um, um, but things are also good, like, like this is, an enormously better time to be in you have life expectancy of 80 in high income countries when 150 years ago it was 40, right? I mean 40, I'm 150 years ago, it's, uh, it's not that long ago and you had half the life expectancy which changes everything. It changes everything what you do. I, did, I have uh, two teenage kids. One of the joys, there's many, many things that are downsides having teenage children, <laughs> but one of the pluses is that every once in a while they understand something like this and like they, they, they see the world through a whole new eyes and my daughter said, now I understand why they had children so young. I'm like, yeah, that's exactly right, because it changes everything. So we document human health, and epidemiology, when you look at the history of epidemiology, has been at the core of developing the methods that document human health. Now, this is life expectancy overall, and of course, a lot of that life expectancy is driven by the drop in child mortality. We should not forget that. Like the enormous, the doubling, essentially, of life expectancy in the past 150 years is slightly distorting because what drives that is the fact that children die much less. The, your, your life expectancy at 40, 150 years ago, was not enormously different than what it is now. Life expectancy overall has increased because child mortality has gone down. This, of course, is all part of the heart of what we do, of how we should be thinking that this is our role and by elevating this role, we illuminate for the world how we're doing and we bear witness. So that's role one. Role two. Role two then is we bring understanding to that. We bring understanding of what shapes population health. So this talks about, this is the HIV epidemic and uh, we're looking at the deaths from HIV, incidence of HIV, prevalence of HIV. That's essentially what you're seeing here, the green line is prevalence, the red line is incidence, and the blue line is deaths. I think the HIV epidemic is 
a really important moment in the history of population health science and de facto in the history of epidemiology because it came at a time right, where we, as a field, had quote unquote solved infectious diseases and uh, where there was this amazing turning point. I mean, great institutions like this one, I see uh, Professor Siege smiling because he lived through this. You know, great institutions like this one had completely disinvested from infectious disease epidemiologists because they're like, we fixed that one. We have, bug, we have antibiotics for it, it's all taken care of. Um, um, the, um, but our understanding of the drivers of things like the HIV epidemic are, is a real and rare contribution to the world that no other discipline <coughs> makes. Are bringing clarity of thought about what is it that's driving the incidence, what is it driving the prevalence. These are things that are very much epidemiology 101, so you're all sitting in this room and you're like, yeah, 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 we know that. But don't forget that this graph, this graph is not understood by anybody who's not an epidemiologist. And that the world would be a much better place if everybody understood this, if everybody understood the incidence, the prevalence, and the number of deaths. So I think that's a really important part of what we do, because that leads to where we are today, where we are today on things like HIV. We're actually doing a, uh, a, a symposium in uh, December on uh, World AIDS Day around the question of eradication of HIV possible. I mean, the fact that we've arrived there in this history of this epidemic is extraordinary. And this is a PrEP, this is a pre-exposure prophylaxis and the latest uh, CDC guidelines about the administration of PrEP. So I started with HIV because in the context of understanding health and showing how epidemiology's understanding can lead us to doing things better and the world to a better place, we, we often do not think about HIV as one of sort of the triumphs of epidemiology. I mean, those of you who are infectious disease epidemiologists think about it all the time, but in the field, it's generally lost. What we tend to think about are things like this. We tend to think about smoking. Um, smoking comes up again and again and again and again, and there's many reasons why smoking <coughs> comes up, in no small part because we got lucky on smoking, because probably the co-occurring causes that uh, happen with smoking have comparable prevalence across populations, so as a result, um, we were able to document smoking as a risk factor despite vastly imperfect studies, but it's fine. Smoking is a, is a success. Things like vaccines, um, uh, this is measles. These are measles rates per um, US state. And what you see is the darker the color, the different, um, uh, the more the measles rate. And of course you see these dark colors, that's where the vaccine was introduced. And then you see the dramatic drop in measles. Of course, the reason I'm showing you this is not just to, to make the point that measles is a triumph, but because I want you to look carefully. And I know it's hard to see it, but if you look carefully, you see this line here? You see how over here it gets darker again, systematically? Right, that's the rise of the anti-vaccine movement. And, and of course, as you all know, in the past year, there have been a number of measles outbreaks, most notably um, recently in New York City. So this represents a, a triumph of epidemiology's capacity to understand what causes health states, a application of that to an approach, and in some respects, unless we're careful, a regression and a failure of the field in something that we previously had conquered. And then the third thing that I think we do is our rigor of causal thinking. And our rigor of causal thinking, to my mind, is second to none. Now, now economists make a claim to this, and I do think it is up to you all in this room to make sure that we, um, uh, we, we are equipped to engage our economist colleagues on fair ground and to make it clear that the, the causal thinking in epidemiology is certainly second to none. Um, I start off here by showing population curves and uh, this is, um, the reason I'm showing population curves is because I feel like epidemiologists often do not think about this as part of the core of causal thinking in epidemiology, but I think this is very much at the heart of how epidemiologists think and at the heart of how epidemiologists should think. The understanding that uh, this is, um, um, uh, looks at the shift in the population distribution of serum cholesterol with two populations that were shifted and then two populations that uh, um, are on top of each other through a population-wide intervention. If anyone hasn't read this paper, it's a great paper. Um, um, the understanding that distributions underlie what we typically tend to focus on, which are point estimates, and that distributions mean that there are people who are more, people who are less on particular risk factors is canonical to understanding in epidemiology and to understanding anything that happens with the data. In the public conversation, the public conversation would be very well served to explain 
population distributions. And uh, we, we're doing a terrible job of explaining that in the public conversation, by the way, but it is part of the heart of our causal thinking. And then I could say a lot more about causal thinking. There's a lot of uh, outstanding work on causal thinking that has come from this department and the school. Um, um, so I'm really just going to show just one paper, which is sort of my favorite paper about uh, causal thinking way back, which is from Mervyn Susser. Um, also happened to be from Columbia Department of Neology, which I happen to chair, so it's a little bit of a competition there. But uh, I actually specifically am putting on a paper that's dog-eared and marked, because this is actually a paper from my own files, which I studied from a long time ago. Um, um, so there's a whole intellectual tradition of causal thinking in epidemiology which advances to this day. So three things we do. We document, we understand what causes population health, and we think carefully about what, what are the causes so that we may then intervene. So what are the challenges? So having said that, what is the world of challenges that the field faces today? And what's the world of challenges that, in some respects, we have to grapple with and that point the way to potential opportunities and solutions? And um, again, the, one can talk about any number of challenges. And what I try to do is I try to distill. I try to distill and say, I spent some time when uh, Professor Hoffman kindly invited me to this lecture, um, um, which was a year ago, given both our schedules. But the good news is it gave me time to actually think about it and actually to do some homework and thinking about it. And I thought the challenges come down to three. Number one, us doing work that matters. Us being concerned with very narrowly defined, what I'm calling here, ill health conditions. And us being slow in embracing non-traditional data and non-traditional methods. And I'm going to discuss each of these. Let's start with work that matters. We all feel strongly that our work matters, as we should, because we spend a lot of time on it. We spend a lot of time, each of us, in what we do. At the same time, we are embedded in a world which looks at us and says, your definition, by the definition of epidemiology, which I showed earlier, is about understanding the conditions that shape the health of populations. And some of these conditions, right now, in 2019, are on fire. So it is understandable that we get caught where if you are saying, by you I mean you epidemiologists, people are saying to us, that you care about the conditions that shape the health of populations, and those conditions are really, really pertinent right now, and you're not spending much time on it, how much does your work really matter? And you know, what are those conditions? I mean, this is, I'm actually putting these side by side, you know, the conversation about social conditions in our society hasn't been this loud, this sharp, this trenchant for 50 years. Like we should not forget that. Like it is important for us to recognize where we sit. I mean, it's been 50 years since we have been having such pointed arguments about issues around income, income inequality, gender, gender equity. And actually, we're putting these side by side. This is obviously from a um, uh, anti-income inequality rally. But then I also want to put side, beside it this paper, which is sort of making money is a patriotic act, um, uh, which was published. You know, this is not obscure. I mean, this is a Wall Street Journal lead um, op-ed two days ago, um, uh, written by Bernie Marcus, who started uh, Home Depot, and John Casimides, who started Christine's. So this, these are issues that are very much live right now in our society. This is um, from the Million Women March. Issues of gender equity, which in many respects were catalyzed by the Me Too movement, obviously reflecting decades and decades um, uh, of uh, building up to this. These issues are so alive, and we don't have any argument. I don't think you just have any plausible argument that these issues do not matter for the health of populations. It just puts us in an awkward position when these issues are on everybody's mind. They should matter to us, but we're not doing much work around them. So right now, I'm just sort of identifying sort of the challenge. That's challenge one. Challenge two, that we are concerned with a narrow set of poor health conditions, a narrower set than probably we should be concerned with. We're about determinants of health states or events, and we should be thinking about the full range of health states. We should be thinking about the full range of health states um, uh, and events. So just to, this is from a paper that I did with a postdoc a couple of years ago, um, uh, where we actually looked at the American Journal of Epidemiology. I'm actually going to show a number of data slides from AJE with apologies to the European Journal of Epidemiology, as uh, edited by Professor Hoffman. Um, um, <laughs> I knew it would be downhill from here. Um, um, but uh, but uh, the, uh, 
the uh, um, um, I'm just I'm just sort of playing for the home team for now. But um, the um, you know this is this is um, we're mapping clustering the um, 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 this is actually uh, work in all the five five high impact journals, including European Journal of Epidemiology, showing you know our clustering around methods, right? So we're thinking about rigor of causal inference, and then we have perinatal obesity, some infectious. That's broadly sort of the areas that we tackle. There's many different ways of, of looking at this, many different ways of saying, so what are the areas that we actually do tackle? So, um, you know, let me go back to the issue of contemporary concern. I said income, income inequality, right, that matters. So I said, well, how much do we actually look at income? So just this very simple search. Income health epidemiology, it's about 38,000 papers. That's good, right? You know, obviously, you get a lot of dreck when you do that, but I, I just want to make a simple point. But is income really what matters? So these are race gaps in income and wealth. Income's on the left, wealth is on the right. How much are we publishing on wealth in epidemiology? 2,000 papers. See that? This is, you know, again, this is, I'm, I'm doing this to, just to make a point. You, you, you all, you're, all, I, you, you're all sophisticated enough to, sort of, to, to understand that I'm not doing a rigorous analysis here. I'm just trying to make the point that it's hard, it's actually hard for us as a discipline to stay contemporary when the leading edge of issues that are on the public, sort of on the tip of the public's tongue are moving so quickly. And while we could say to ourselves, look, we are tackling income, but God, social epidemiology wasn't really a thing until 25 years ago, so we're doing income, yay to us. Well, all of a sudden the world is like moved on saying, yeah, that's very nice, but wealth ultimately is what's underlying deep racial um, uh, disparities. And we're like not there yet. So I think this is a challenge. I think this is a challenge. And I hope you all realize that part of what I'm doing here is I'm not, I'm, I guess I'm pointing fingers at all of us, but simply saying I'm trying to understand the challenges so we can actually figure out how best to respond to them. Um, another challenge that we have is that we have, although actually we've gotten lucky on this in the public conversation, that we have skated by us, our culpability in the replication crisis. You know, you know something's a thing when it actually has a Wikipedia page. So <laughs> I was actually surprised that replication crisis is a Wikipedia page. I thought it was like a nebulous concept, but no, it is a page. There is the Wikipedia page of replication crisis. And um, you know, the, the, the discipline that's been battered on this has been largely psychology. But you know, the fact that we haven't been battered on this is either we got, we're getting lucky or be Nobody's thinking about us. Both, both are bad, actually, as far as I'm concerned, because we're just as guilty on, uh, on this as are the psychologists, because at core, the replication crisis is really an issue of external validity and reproducibility of work, which ultimately is an issue of um, representing the populations of interest. I mean, it's ultimately what this is about. And, uh, and we are as sinning as our other disciplines on this. So our concern with ill health, with, with narrow set of conditions, leads to this kind of replication crisis. So we looked at, um, with um, one of um, our uh, doctoral students who's in the uh, audience um, today, um, um, just in preparation of this talk, we thought, let's look at, at one journal just in the past year. This is where we looked at AJE. Um, uh, and said, what, is, what has been published in American Journal of Epidemiology in 2018? So this is just the last year. So what, are, what, what did AJE publish in 2018? Um, uh, well, mostly, I mean, the, the plurality was methods, as you can see. And then we're publishing pregnancy, cardiovascular disease, mental health, just to surprise me, cancer. From a point of view of cause of death, that's sort of not too shocking. Fairly similar to what I showed you in all those other journals um, um, over the course of time. But then the other thing we did is we tried to take apart these papers, not just by outcome, but by themes, like thematically. What approach are we taking to pregnancy, CBD, and mental health? And we divided it as follows the biomedical, methods, policy, and social approaches. And just to show you an example of what we mean by this, so here's an example of biomedical. It's papers like this, so she's circulating 25 hydroxyvitamin D3 concentrations with incident um, uh, cancer risk, right? This remains, this remains the majority of papers that are published in the American Journal of Epidemiology today. And I'm not here to say it's bad or good, like I just wanna be very clear. I'm, 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 I'm really trying to reflect, I'm trying to reflect together and say this remains largely what we're doing, but Hopefully, we can all recognize that if this is the majority of what we're publishing, it puts us a bit of at odds with the first part of what we do, which is we document health and we're sensitive to social conditions, particularly when the social conditions are in so much on people's minds and there's such live wire issues. 
So that's that. Methods, I mean, we do sort of 15% methods. That's just one example of the paper. And the social side, dealing with residential um, uh, racial isolation. And the policy side, bars, restaurants, smoking, etc. This is broadly, thematically, what is being published today in our journal, which may be fine, may be fine, but it certainly creates a bit of a tension with the core notion that we care about fundamental forces that shape the health of populations, knowing what those forces are, having those, fo those forces loud and clear in the public conversation, and then being relatively um, not super represented in what we actually do. And the third challenge is our methods, in that we have a set of methods. In the definition of epidemiology, which I'm not going to show you again, nowhere did it ever say we do this using these methods. By right? our definition is we understand the conditions that shape the health of the population, so we may do something about it. But what we seem to do is to say we understand the conditions that shape the health of populations, so we may do something about it, comma, as long as we use regression methods. <laughs> and that is true. So this is papers published in AJE 2018 again. Just, this is just, we just did one calendar year for the purpose of this conversation. And about half is regression methods. So it's half. It's not, it's not 70, 80 percent. It's half. That's, that's, that's okay. I mean, we, we, uh, you know, one could argue that there is some sort of a, that, that, I mean, we haven't gone back in time in this. We might go back in time. And, you know, might also compare AJE to European Journal and, to, you know, to compare uh, how, how they do with each other. Um, um, so this is something that really reflects our, what we're comfortable with and what, and, and what is the mainstream in our discipline. And then one other aspect of, it's not just methods, it's also methods and data. Our comfort with different methods and data. So what are the sample sizes that we publish? So this slide, same thing, one, one year, one calendar year of AJE, um, uh, our sample sizes. It's actually interesting. You see, it's roughly a quarter each. I mean, it's a, so you have you know, a little bit less than a quarter of small samples, under 1,000, well, that's case control. You have about a little bit more than a quarter in the 1,000 to 10,000 range. Then you have 10,000, 50,000. But a quarter is actually more than 50,000 samples um, uh, in sample size in, in HAE. So we, I actually bet this has changed quite a bit over time and uh, that you're dealing with sort of with these quarter, quarter, quarter. And you know, you say, well, really a quarter of our work with large sample, more than 50,000, that's good. It's particularly good in the context of the replication crisis. But of course, these numbers become a little bit small when you compare to this which are the sort of the social media available, 2.4 billion, um, you know, 1 billion, 200 million, et cetera. And this reflects, of course, that we, as epidemiologists, have been queasy about engaging in this data space. And I'll explain in a second why there's reasons for that queasiness, and there's appropriate reasons for that queasiness, but it still, to my mind, represents a challenge. So the challenges. We're probably too narrow in our methods, probably too narrow in uh, ultimately what we look at, and uh, we are, um, it's, it's hard for us to keep up with doing work that is matters, particularly when our remit is to be deeply embedded in all the forces that shape health and when those forces are shifting rapidly and the conversation about those forces are shifting rapidly. So let's switch to opportunities. Let's switch to opportunities. So the opportunities, not surprisingly, are in some respects the converse of the challenges. But I do think that when I was preparing this talk, I was thinking again about students in the room mostly. I was thinking like, you know, how do I want to feel if I were a student in a talk like this? And I think the way I would want to feel is, well, the field is doing well, check. There's a lot of problems, check. Which means there's a lot of things that I can do better, check. So that's what I'm trying to get to all the students, to say, you see the problems that the, the previous generation is handing you, now go out and fix it and, and do good things. So opportunities, three things. Number one, I think we can grapple with letters most. I think we can expand our way of causal thinking, and I think we can embrace increasingly available data. So let me talk about each of these. Let me start with number one, which is grappling with what matters most. And, uh, and now I'm bringing in some writing which I've done, which was in the initial title I gave about consequentialist epidemiology. So this was a paper which I did a few years ago, arguing for consequentialist epidemiology, which ultimately is a recalibration of the foundations of the discipline, clarifying our research priorities, and offering a perspective on um, the place of novel ep you know, epidemiologic approaches, which also has implications for our students. The point I was making here was that we 
cannot afford not to pay attention to the broader forces that matter. And this, to my mind, continues to fit in as a real opportunity, that us saying, how is it that we grapple with issues of contemporary consequence that we know, we know both intuitively and conceptually matter for population health, should be part of our remit. How is it that we expand our thinking to include these forces? So number one is not being afraid of tackling issues that matter and pushing ourselves to do so. And notice that I'm not suggesting doing that. This is not a sort of throwing out the big wood of bathwater type, type argument. I'm simply saying that this fits in well within our remit as epidemiologists and that we can do this and do this better than anybody else based on what I started off at the beginning of what epidemiology can do and can do uniquely. So number one, we can grapple with issues of consequence. I think we can do it. And we can do it by being creative and thoughtful about expanding what we do. That's number one. Part of that is expanding our causal thinking. Part of that is expanding our lens. This is uh, of a population health science, which was the other part that was in the uh, original title. And this is the definition of population health science that in the book I did with uh, Professor Keyes at Columbia, we talked about population health science is conditions that shape distributions of health and mechanisms through which these conditions manifest as health, which you'll see has a lot of echoes to what epidemiology is. We did not talk about making the world better in it because we actually have seen population health science as a foundational science. But the thinking is that when epidemiology sees itself as nested within population health science, it then recognizes that there are implications for how we teach our students and how we go about our problems. It recognizes that ultimately we are interested in a population. And when we're interested in a population, we can teach epidemiology in a population first approach. And that ends up having implications for the science, the questions we ask, and the relevance of our answer. So this actually manifests then, and these are principles of epidemiology that we articulated in a, in a book called Epidemiology Matters, where we said you start from population, you understand your exposures, you take a sample that matters, you estimate your measurement association, you rigorously evaluate the association, you assess the evidence that the causes work together, and you assess the extent to which the results matter are externally valid. The, and you, know, you can look at this and say, yeah, yeah, that's roughly what we do. And our point here is, it shouldn't be roughly what we do. It should, it should be precisely what we do, because that has implications for what we do. And I would like to think that we had the, the, the sort of the prescience to, in here, to talk about things that have actually since become real problems, like things like the replication crisis. We really were anticipating and talking about making sure that we take samples that matter, and samples that are generalizable. And now, this is from a paper that is currently in press that's co-authored with Miguel Arnal in this department. What we've been trying to do is to say, can we reconcile then some of the challenges of tackling issues that matter, which broadly have been within the remit of what's called social epidemiology, with the broader goal of epidemiology to understand causal inference. By the way, just for the record, I have said before, so I'll say it here again, I actually think that over time, the term social epidemiology should disappear. Now, by label, by discipline label, I'm a social epidemiologist, I think that label should disappear. The reason I think it should disappear is because it creates silos, and it says that only a certain kind of epidemiologist is concerned with a certain kind of exposures, when in fact, my argument is that these are, we should be concerned with the breadth of exposures to shape distribution of health and populations, and I, I don't really care to be labeled as such. I think it should be something that should infuse what we all do. But be that as it may, what, what Miguel and I have tried to do with this paper, <coughs> which you can read is coming out soon, including three commentaries of varying degrees of um, dissatisfaction with the commentary, so you can read those, <laughs> and, then, and then you can read our rebuttal to the commentaries, um, uh, and then you can decide um, uh, what you think. But uh, briefly, let me just explain this. I mean, this paper <coughs> really tries to say, given all the stuff, given all these things, remember I said at the beginning, there's been all this sort of descent at the margins. How do we bring it together? How do we harmonize it together and make it <coughs> make sense? And uh, here's the, the, the um, question that we use, so I'm going to have some water, is how do we understand how social factors cause heart disease? How do we grapple with the role of things like race, or residential segregation, or the role of income? And we propose that you can actually think about all these forces along a spectrum. You can think of them along a spectrum, and you have, you have, you ask yourself, 
to what extent can these forces be experimentally manipulated? Mm -hmm. On the right, you have this consensus that we can experimentally manipulate. On the left, you have no consensus we can experimentally manipulate. And you could arguably place things like race, residential segregation, and income along such a spectrum. Now, why do you say that? Well, let's take income. You can imagine a hypothetical experiment where we randomly assign household. Get a salary bonus, no salary bonus. You follow them for decades, and you compare heart disease. That is a way to operationalize the effect of income on heart disease. Income works on that way. How about residential segregation? Well, it's really harder to think of an experimental manipulation, but you can. You know, you can randomly assign families to different neighborhoods, which has been done, things like movement to opportunity study, right? And you can follow them for decades. It's hard to do, sorry. Right? It's hard to do, and it sort of it pushes the bounds of counterfactual thinking to say that you're moving a family and keeping everything else constant, because obviously you're not. It's, that's sort of, it's, it's a bit of a silly argument. Um, uh, it's a vague experiment. It's a vague op operation, operationalization of um, residential segregation, but, but it's certainly not as good as income. It's probably better than something else. But then you get to race. It's really hard to think of a hypothetical experiment where you're going to operationalize race, because it's really hard to think of a way to change the effect of race of heart disease by keeping everything else constant. Now, what's that do? What it does is it's trying to bring together, what this paper tries to do, it tries to bring together this notion that we should engage with issues that matter. We should not stint on our causal rigor in doing so. And we should use creative approaches and creative methods to help us answer those questions, right? So that's why, in many respects, this brings together these various trends I'm talking about. And um, you know, when I go back to the definition I started with, epidemiology study of distribution determines of health states and uh, events, but it's also the application of the studies and control of health problems. And if that's the case, we should be focusing on things that matter that we think are manipulable to the extent of controlling health problems. So it gives us an impetus to do that more. And furthermore, now I go back to why I think social epidemiology should go away. We are not that different than how we think of the things like statins, diet, and chronic inflammation. They all matter for heart disease, and they all sit differently on our consensus line. Statins, you can, you can readily think of a manipulable. Inflammation, much less so. Now, all of this then comes back to not simply thinking about issues that matter, thinking creatively about them, but also then applying different methods, moving beyond the regression straitjacket. And, and I have, in my work, written sort of a reasonable amount about the use of um, simulation models. And there are many different other approaches. And sometimes I'm misunderstood where people say, uh, you know, we think we shouldn't do simulation models for everything. Not at all. I just think they have a very particular niche, a very particular purpose. But in this paper, if you're interested, we actually talk about, um, so it turns out that Professor Hernan actually has a commentary on this paper, where he mostly agrees with this, but some also disagrees, which is fine, um, um, where um, we, talks about, we talked about how simulation study is, can be thought of as an agent-based counterfactual to address particular questions. And in particular, going back to now the consensus line I showed you, if income is readily randomizable and as a result lends itself naturally to thinking about causes in a traditional causal empiric framework, if res racial residential segregation is somewhere in the middle, it might say that we might actually want to use different methods for racial residential segregation, perhaps using things like simulation methods. Because we know things like this in the Annals of Documenting Health. This is Chicago, a black concentration, concentration of uh, low life expectancy. And we actually have done that. We have applied simulation modeling models to this. This is from a paper published in Epidemiology, um, um, led by Magdalena Serda, who's now at NYU, where we actually look at a a simulated counterfactual experiment to manipulate racial, spatial, racial, residential segregation, showing that unless you do so, if you're trying to target the consequences of violence, you will not narrow racial inequities unless you also deal with racial residential segregation. Right. So the reason I'm bringing this together is to say that if we are trying to think rigorously about this challenge we have of dealing with difficult issues within a particular methodological straitjacket, we can be disciplined in our thinking, think about how causal, what causal methods teach us, and use that then to guide which methods we apply to particular questions. The third opportunity, and I'm going to start winding down, 
is to embrace less traditional data and less traditional approaches. So this is um, data science master's degree programs in the US. Um, um, if I were chair of an epidemiology department or a dean of the School of Public Health, I would be very worried about this. Um, um, <laughs> look at this. I mean, 2014, which is five years ago, there was no such thing as data science in, uh, in any organized way. And now it's taking over the world. And, you know, can I just point out that data science is what you all do? Yep. Um, um, so so I, I do think that, um, you know, this is, a, this, is a, this is an opportunity. It's both a threat and opportunity, obviously. And, you know, you, there is this breathless nar narrative about this. Like this is a ASA, statisticians use social media to track foodborne illness and improve disaster response. Maybe. Um, um, the, um, you know, they need us in this. This is a good example of this. This is using Yelp for foodborne illness surveillance. How many of you have read about this? I mean, everybody knows about this. You know, foodborne illness surveillance through the web is fine. So this is um, where Yelp reviews come from in Georgia. This is poverty in Georgia, right? You can immediately see through our epidemiologic lens some of the limitations of these approaches. And I'm here to tell you that our colleagues well-intentioned though they may be in data science, who are rushing into the sort of data science gold rush, do not have the grounding that you all have from a discipline that has for a long time documented health, understood the causes of health, applied rigorous causal thinking approaches to advance our understanding. That is what we do, right? That's what I started with, what we do. It is also our threats when we don't do it well, but it's also our opportunity set. It really is the same thing. That's what we do, is our threats and our opportunities. So let me conclude in just two more minutes and I'll, I want to leave time for questions. So one last thing, since I'm looking at the future, um, I thought it was important to end, not just with the subject matter of what we do, but also to talk about who we are um, um, and who is the world and who do we need to be if we are going to be a discipline that with seriousness of intent and honesty of purpose, look at ourselves in the mirror and say, we are here to deal with population health, the health of populations. It doesn't say the health of populations only for specific groups, right? So that we can document it and understand it and make the world a better place. Well, who is the world? Who is that world of which we speak? Well, this is the world. This is where populations are. With like 2.8 billion, among so 8 to 9 billion, are in China and India. Um, uh, and uh, there's sort of many other countries. And if you just compare it as a as population by region, this is Asia, that's Africa, and there is sort of, you know, I mean, who cares about North America with this kind of picture? And uh, no, I mean, I'm being provocative on purpose, but uh, I do think that given that our purpose is to understand populations, it would be foolish of us to say, we are blind to where populations are. So for those of you who actually have a grounding in Asia and Africa, an opportunity to make a difference, I mean, if I were a student with an opportunity to make a difference in Asia and Africa, I would say, this is fantastic, because this is clearly where populations are and where I can really make a difference. Now, how about us? Where are we publishing? Go back to, um, <laughs> sorry, Professor Fauzi is like, this is good. <laughs> um, uh, see, it's not just the students. Even the faculty look at these things and say, this is good, this is good. I can see where my work's going. Um, um, what about our publication? So this is you know, where the world is. This is where we publish. This is, again, AJE, um, uh, which is 53% American, a uh, quarter European, and the rest sort of a slice. And that's fine. I mean, it's nothing surprising there. I, I don't think I'm telling you anything that's surprising. Um, I found this a little bit surprising that 95% uh, of papers published in the in one year are single country, like, like narrow single country. And I thought that was uh, perhaps um, less than, you know, had you asked me to guess before I did this, I would have actually thought this would be higher, and I think we can actually do better. One, uh, one last slide on data. This is who we are as epidemiologists. So this is uh, epidemiologists, this is uh, the largest epidemiology site. This is courtesy of Henry Schusterman, and the president of OCR, um, um, which is we're predominantly white. We're Asian, about 25% Asian, the rest of everybody else. And uh, it seems to me like for a discipline that uh, our, <coughs> our self-definition is understanding populations, it would be remiss for us not to say that we need to represent those populations so in order for us to understand and add to our conversation insight that otherwise we would not have. So I think this is, again, none of this is meant to be a... Uh, a sort of a sky is falling indictment. It's simply meant to be a reflection, a reflection on the 
on the challenges that we've been facing as a discipline, a reflection on our opportunities, and an attempt to sort of bring all of these together in tune with one another as we look forward. I'll end with, uh, with uh, a, um, a, a quote from uh, Bertrand Russell, um, uh, which I really love, actually. These are three passions, simple but overwhelming and strong of my life, longing for love, search for knowledge, and unbearable pity for the suffering of humankind. And um, leaving aside love, which we can talk about, but uh, you know, I thought I really like his juxtaposing sort of this search for knowledge and pity for the suffering of humankind. It's an archaic language, but I think we all understand it. Um, because I do think that's what epidemiology affords us, actually. It is a field which is intellectually rich, tremendous opportunities to search for knowledge, and grounded in an appreciation for how we can make humankind better. And you know, I can really, I can scarcely think of a better occupation, a better discipline to be in. That's it, we'll stop with the questions. Thank you very much. Very well tempered. <laughs> Wonderful. May I invite questions or comments? Yes. Suggestions? Yes. I sound really tall tonight. Dr. Just Vino, wondering, please. wondering that uh, improvement of uh, knowledge yes. and human disease is expanding so fast and uh, yes. that can actually help. We can see what matters most yes. to disease and uh, health. Mm -hmm. So, how, but I uh, you know, how, how does that fit into your scheme yeah. besides uh, what about that? Yeah, yeah, I think it's a good question. I, I think it's a problem for the students in the room, actually, because I think when, you know, you, you and I, if I may be so bold to our generation, um, you know, you're an epidemiologist and you say, I'm going to be a psychiatric epidemiologist or a, you know, this type of cancer epidemiologist, I'm going to do it for my career. I, I'm not sure that that holds anymore. I actually think that um, the... Um, you know, if, if you are, if you started off training as a hepatitis epidemiologist, given the, the, the rapid change in the landscape of hepatitis morbidity and mortality, that's going to change very quickly. So I do think that, in part, we as epidemiologists need to be much better at being broader in what the students who are looking forward are, are going to be doing, because the narrowness of predetermined remit from school might well change over the 60 years of a student's life. So I think it's very important. Yes, please. Um, I noticed you, you mentioned sometimes about making the world healthier, making the world a better place, mm -hmm. yet I didn't see anything directly related to advocacy or getting yes. things done. What do you think is, or is there a role in advocacy in epidemiology, and how much are you, you worry about like, kind of yeah. implementing the knowledge that you're producing or reproducing? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, um, so, in, um, I, I really do think that population health science is a basic, is a basic science, and I think what we do is a basic science. I think the application of that to creating a better world is in public health, you know, broadly speaking, and advocacy fits within that bucket. So I don't think that disciplinarily, advocacy is necessarily a sine qua non definition of what we do. Having said that, I think uh, epidemiologists are citizens, and I think uh, citizens have a, a responsibility for advocacy, particularly when they know things that our citizens do not. I think there are challenges with scientists being engaged in advocacy, both in terms of bias, real bias, but perhaps more importantly, perceived bias. And I think there is a challenge with perceived bias. So I think anybody who, any individual scientist who embraces advocacy needs to think carefully about the extent to which that's going to influence their work and how their work is seen. But having said that, I suppose the way I answer this in our school is I think no individual scientist has a responsibility for advocacy. I think the enterprise, the school, has a responsibility for advocacy leaving open the opportunity for those who are comfortable to engage in it and those who are not comfortable not to engage in it. Thank you for asking that. Thank you for the balanced answer. Yes, please. Carmen. Hello. Um, I had a question. I thought your talk was excellent. I wanted to know, sort of as a person coming into the field as a junior faculty member looking to the next 10 or 15 mm -hmm. years, how, as a dean of a school of public health, do you see yourself sort of positioning both the education, the research, the funding streams? How do you kind of merge your ideas into sort of real application? to hmm. sort of develop programs and, and yeah. departments in a way that can sort of embrace this. And so what are sort of the trends that you're sort of thinking about? What are the directions? How do you redevelop education programs, teaching, yeah. funding, pressure to publish, like mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff? How do you do well, everybody, all, yeah, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> all in two minutes yeah, because yeah, there's yeah, a class yeah, waiting yeah. outside. Everybody sit back. Um, um, <laughs> well, um, um, 
you know, I, 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 I think the, there's one answer to your, to, to your question, but then you throw in a word in there, which is funding, which complicates everything. <laughs> so um, I'm going to just tackle that, and then I'm happy to talk offline about the other answers. Um, um, I think um, it, it, is, it is reasonable to recognize that when you're doing population health, right, it is a rare context in which somebody is going to give you millions of dollars to just build whatever population health studies you want. The truth is, all over the world, it depends on funding in some way or another, right? And funding is a slow, ungainly beast that depends on trends and mainstreams, and it changes, but it changes slowly and painfully. So I think as an individual scientist, it's important to be a part of systems of thinking that will generate funding so you can do your work without also losing your soul about things that you may be passionate about. And I think having both as two separate strands that intersect but clearly differ in your mind might be helpful. You know, I've become convinced that most interesting papers of most scientists end up are unfunded. That means that there are people who have funding, but then the, the, the really the passionate work that really makes a difference ends up being unfunded. That's certainly been true for my career. Um, I've also been continuously funded in my career. So it's like, it doesn't mean that you're not passionate about the work that's funded. It's just it's a different axis of work. So I, I would encourage anybody who's starting out to like keep those two in balance. You know, then the rest of your questions, which are about sort of the meta, about how institutions balance educational, ed educational prerogatives, responsibilities, that's a, that's a really interesting basket. And this whole separate time.